Hey there. Um, I want to say that, uh, oh, I went the wrong way. Um, I want to talk for a minute about, you could say maybe like three groups, and I don't want to divide people into groups, but it does seem like there are people who are starting to see or maybe, yeah, they're becoming aware that the church is thoroughly Galatianized. We've been teaching about that for quite a long time. What does it mean to be Galatianized? It means that you teach and believe that the Christian life is a mix of law and works. Uh, law and grace, I'm sorry. Uh, somebody came on my wall yesterday and, and he said, I, I, I see what you're saying about the first John thing that you wrote, but I go to a doctrinally sound institutional church and it's fine. He's like, so what exactly is the problem with the institutional churches? I'm like, if you don't know, I don't even know where to begin. So I said, read Romans and Galatians. He said, well, I, I have read those books. Okay. And I said, well, here, how's this? Uh, most people have a, re a redefinition of the word justification where they believe that justification is just a free gift to get you into heaven. Justification means you're going to heaven when you die. And that sanctification and rewards is all by works. And uh, I said, due to the redefinition of the word justification, most people are Galatianized and don't know what Galatianism is. Um, because they think the book about book of Galatians deals with justification, and since they supposedly know what justification is, they don't have a problem with Galatian error. Uh, he didn't respond, because he had no idea what I was talking about. Of course, I'm sure he believes that sanctification is by work. If he, if he is sitting in an institutional church and thinks that, and has no idea what I'm talking about, and thinks all the institutional churches are fine, and he goes to a doctrinally sound institutional church, then he hasn't even begun to make the distinctions, you know. Um, so there's no ground to even talk about it. Uh, you know, he doesn't know who I am or what we teach or anything like that. But that's the root of the problem, is that it's an incoherent mix of law and grace based on the a redefinition of the word justification. Uh, you know, we've talked about the redefinition of the word faith a lot, where we try to make that a work based on James 2, but the word justification by most so-called grace believers is redefined because they just believe it means you're going to heaven. But again, that's not how the apostles argued, nor is that what they preached. They preached when you are justified or when you believe the gospel, they didn't say you're going to go to heaven when you die. They said you're going to receive the Spirit, and the Spirit is the eternal life. The Spirit is the Son coming to you. He's the Spirit of the Son, the Spirit of Sonship, the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit of Christ, Christ Himself. The last Adam became the life-giving Spirit. And many people are subtly, whether they know it or not, they're tritheist. Jesus is in heaven and the Spirit is on earth and they don't even know what the Spirit's for and they've got an idea of three gods and, uh, they're confused. No, God sent the Son, the Father sent the Son, and when the Father sent the Son, He came with the Son. And the Son said, when you see me, you've seen the Father, because I am in the Father, and the Father is and the Father is in me. It's not that the Son is the Father, but He came with the Father, and in the Father, and the Father came in Him. And then, He sent the Spirit from the Father, in the name of the Son, as the Son. And when the Spirit comes, he said, if you receive the one I send, you receive me, and he who receives me receives the Father who sent me. So we've received the triune God. We received, which is the eternal life. The eternal life is God himself coming to abide in us forever. So we abide in the Father and uh, in the Son. And Jesus said in that day, when you receive the Spirit, you will know that I am in my Father and my Father in me. And I in you and you in me, in John 14, 21, I believe. Um, but this is what justification is for. Justification is not to send you to heaven. 
justification is for you to be rightly related to God now as the Spirit. And the Spirit is the reality of the Christian life, which he's called the Spirit of Reality. And he is installed in us as a fountain to spring up under everlasting life, according to John 4, 14. And as rivers to flow out of our innermost being. And he is a drink of living water to, that we're to come freely and drink when we're thirsty. And he's the food and he's the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ for us to eat and drink because his word is spirit and life. And there are three that bear witness on earth, which is the blood and the water, which is the word and the spirit. Um, they are one. And it's in the word, that the word of life that we handle that Christ himself is ministered to us as spirit to satisfy us with God himself. And it's the tree of life and the river, the water of life to be our nourishment. God wants to nourish us with himself and satisfy us with himself. And this is how we live the Christian life, by eating and drinking Christ. And uh, that's what justification is for. Justification is so that I can have access to the spirit and the spirit is the reality of the Christian life. And if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And he's talking about my word, which is spirit and life. And uh, it is by dwelling in the word of the gospel, the truth of the word, which is spirit. Uh, and acknowledging the fellowship of your faith becomes effectual through the acknowledging of every good thing that is in you that is in Christ. Acknowledging the truth and being sanctified in the truth. Sanctify them in thy truth, thy word is true. That we're washed and renewed. Where uh, Paul says, Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he may sanctify her through the washing of the water of the word. There is no sanctification apart from this reality. So people who teach that sanctification is something separate from justification and that it's a matter of law keeping are teaching Galatian error. Because the center of gravity for Galatians is, uh, O oh foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ is set forth as crucified, this I would learn from you, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? And then in that chapter, he talks about what justification is. Justification is so that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through faith, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit. The Spirit is the blessing that we've received in the hearing of the gospel. And the Spirit is how we live the Christian life. And that's what he's talking about in Galatians is, I've been crucified, I died to the law, that I might live unto God. I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. In the life I now live, I live in the flesh, I live in the faith, or by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And this life is Christ in me, who is the Spirit of the Son. Galatians 4, 6 says, uh, Because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into our heart, crying, Abba, Father. And this Spirit is the blessing of the gospel and is the eternal life and is God himself in the Son as the Spirit to be my life. So that it is not just I, but Christ living in me. Yes, it's I, but it's a new I, the new creation I, which is not just I, but Christ. And the way I live it is by faith. And that's what justification is for. Justification is not just go to heaven when you die. Now, I'm going to say something that's going to offend a lot of rank Ralph Yankee Arnold fans. But somebody shared a video with me, and I'm looking for the link, but... It was his teaching on James 2, and it was only um, about five minutes. But he was teaching from James 2, and he said exactly this. He said, when James is teaching justification, and Paul is teaching justification, it seems contradictory, because Paul teaches that justification is a matter of, to him who works not, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Okay, so it's without works and it's a free gift. He cannot earn it. He did that very well. He teaches that form of justification very well. But James clearly says that justification is by works. 
So what is the discrepancy? And he did not take the path most grace teachers teach, which is to say that James is talking about justification before men and making your faith useful for men. No, he said justification in Paul's view is the free gift that lets you go to heaven when you die. I'm going to heaven because of the free gift of justification by faith apart from works. But James teaches justification to live before God, and that's by works. That was the most blatant example of Galatian error I had ever heard, and this is... Now, I'll tell you, I've never heard of Ralph Anke Arnold before I came to uh, this community or came on YouTube. I don't have a bone to pick or anything like that, but I know that he is held up as the evangelist in this community that you know, has helped a lot of people see eternal security. Um, now, that's fine, and I know he's a good evangelist for justification, except it is a redefinition of justification exactly as I've been teaching through Galatians. I didn't know that's what he taught, because I've never listened to Ralph Yankee Arnold, but somebody sent me this three-minute video, and I was quite surprised. Uh, it was in my comments, so YouTube deletes the comments, and I don't leave links on my comments. I didn't want people stumbling on that, so I watched it, because they were confused, and I said, yeah, you can't, I wouldn't, uh, wow, you know, and then I deleted the, and now I'm like, man, I wish I could find that video. Um, that was the most blatant example of the redefinition of justification that I've been talking about for the last year that I've seen. Most people hold that view, though, and don't see a problem with it. Justification means I'm going to heaven, but James is, for Paul, but James's view is that justification is by works because that's talking about how I live before God. And under that umbrella, people teach things like 1 John 1, 9 is teaching you how to fellowship with God, and if you don't confess all your sins, you're in darkness. And until you confess your sins, you're not in the light, and you're not in the fellowship. No. First John is teaching who is in the light and who is in the darkness. The people who are in the darkness are the ones who say they have no sin. They're the ones who say they have fellowship with God. They're the ones who deny Jesus Christ is the propitiation for the sins of the, their sins and the sins of the whole world. They're the ones who take the way of Cain and hate their brothers while they say they love God. They are in the darkness. They're the antichrists among us who are seducing us. The ones who are in the light are those who say they have sin, but they have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, uh, who is the propitiation for our sins. The confession is not just a pra is not a practice of confessing your sins in order to have fellowship. It is a basic confession of who Jesus Christ is and not a denial that distinguishes the sons of God from the Antichrist. That's what 1 John is about. But when you've got this view that justification is for going to heaven and sanctification is by works and you've got a redefinition of justification that doesn't give me access to the spirit and says that the spirit is gained by works, you're going to have problems, major problems with the Christian life and you're going to be stumbling babes in the very people that teach people what eternal security is are going to also bring them into bondage and that's why uh, people stay in bondage even though they because they keep listening to the very teachers who taught them the gospel but now for the Christian life they teach them this mixture and then they wonder why they can't get out from under condemnation and they can't get unconfused and they live under this mixture well because you think that it's okay to listen to Galatian error. This is Galatian error. And this is what 99.999% of Christians believe and almost every teacher teaches. Um, the justification is by believing in the blood, right? I believe without working. I'm a filthy, wretched sinner. I'm ungodly. I'm weak. I can't do anything. I can't make any vow to change my situation. I can't make any promises to do better. I can't overcome 
anything. And while I was yet a sinner, ungodly, an enemy of God, God reconciled me to himself through the death of his son. And I believed, and therefore I was reconciled, and I have peace with God through my Lord Jesus Christ. And now, having been justified by faith, I'm standing in grace and rejoicing in the hope of glory of God, even though I have no right to, if you look at me. Okay, now that does not qualify me just to go to heaven, that qualifies me for the Spirit, which is the means of sanctification. What is, what is sanctification? Well, Paul says in Thessalonians, God has chosen you from the beginning to sanctification by the Spirit through the belief in the truth. And Jesus said, uh, Father, sanctify them in thy truth, thy word is truth. And Paul said, Christ gave himself uh, for the church, he loved her, to that he may sanctify her by the washing of the water of the word. It is to be nourished with Christ himself as our food and drink, as our life supply, and as our satisfaction. But the Galatian error tells me, no, you can't have the Spirit. You can't have God's pleasure. You can't rejoice in the hope of the glory of God because you're not right with God. Even though you're going to heaven when you die, there's something wrong in your relationship because you sinned. God has turned his back on you. He can't look at sin. And so he's, you've grieved him because you sinned. No, the only way to grieve God is to not believe the gospel and to not come forward boldly based on the blood. But we have access by faith in the blood and are encouraged to draw near boldly. And we have a high priest who's touched with the feeling of our weaknesses and intercedes for us. And, uh, and we're told to come forward boldly in our time of need to find grace to the throne of grace. The throne is not a throne of judgment for us. It is a throne of grace. Let us come forward boldly to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So that's when I'm being tempted, when I'm being buffeted for my faults. There's no glory for being buffeted for my faults, but that's when I need it. That's when I need the grace. It's when I sin. It's, you know, John says, uh, I write these things to you that no man may sin, but if any man sins, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous, who himself is the propitiation for our sins. That's when I need to run to him, not run away from him. And Galatian error binds your conscience, tells you God's mad at you, and teaches you that you better go fix your sin, otherwise you're not going to be able to come to God or tells you that you need to remind yourself and remind God of your sin by confessing it. Like the Old Testament priests, you know, Hebrews makes the point that as long as they were doing those continual offerings for sin, the scapegoat offerings, they, they couldn't perfect their conscience, they couldn't draw near, but it was a reminder of sin year after year. For if the offerings had perfected their conscience, number one, they would have ceased to be offered. Number two, uh, there would be no more conscious of sins. But the once and for all offering of Christ has forever perfected those who he has sanctified through his blood. And we can draw near and have our conscience purged, our heart purged from an evil conscience by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we can be washed in the fellowship. We have a right to it. That's called exercising your right to them, he, to them uh, who believed he gave the authority become the children of God and the rights of our sonship is that we have the blood of Jesus Christ the purchase of our sins and we overcome by the word of our testimony and the blood of the lamb and we loved out our soul life even unto death we, we, we say I am crucified with Christ I died to the law I'm not trying to make vows and clean myself up and behave better before God is pleased with me I run boldly to him even when I did big, my big sin even when I'm living in the consequences of my sin I run to him I run to him okay uh, now in this community, this YouTube community, 99% of the so-called grace teachers that are good at teaching eternal security teach Galatian error. When it comes to discipline, when it comes to when it comes to discipline, they've got it wrong. They teach you that discipline is God's training of your flesh so that you'll be a better person. Well, that's Galatian error because 
again, Paul says in Galatian, to the Galatians, having begun in the spirit, are you now going to be perfected in the flesh? No, are you foolish? We don't go back to law for the perfecting of the flesh, and God's discipline is not to train your flesh. Your flesh cannot learn any lessons, nor is God trying to train it to become better. God is not sending trials into your life so that you become more peaceful or better behaved by learning again and again and again how to be nicer. That's perfecting the flesh by law keeping. No, God's discipline is to teach you to abide in Christ and to teach you that you can't be better, that you are defeated, that you can't be nicer, that you're always going to fail, that you're every time, no matter how many times you think you've overcome, when you hit that situation, you always act the same way. That's what he was doing with the children of Israel. They went around that same mountain again and again and again and always reacted the same way. Abraham, uh, you know, some, well, it doesn't, I'm not going to go into all that, but um, we repeat the same mistakes again and again and again and we don't learn the lesson. We say, well, and I repent and I'm going to try again. And then we try again, and we fail, and then we say, well, I must not have repented hard enough, and God's probably mad at me. Maybe I'm not even a believer, because if I was, and maybe I wasn't sorry. Maybe I didn't repent enough, because if I'd really repented, I wouldn't do it anymore. No, you haven't discovered what the flesh is. The training and the discipline of God is not to teach your flesh to do something better and get you to perfect it. It is to show you what your flesh is so that you will judge it. That's what it means. We love not our soul life even unto death. We finally say, I've been, I through the law died to the law. I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I now have to live by the faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I've got to die to the law. The demand is not on me. That's what the training is for. The discipline is unpleasant because you're faced with the reality of what you are, and it's embarrassing. Uh, when you discover, oh my gosh, look what I am. But we finally agree with God's judgment and it yields the peaceable fruits of righteousness by those who are exercised by it. And what are the peaceful fruits of righteousness? Therefore, having been justified by faith, I have peace with God through my Lord Jesus Christ and I stay, have access by faith into this grace in which I stand and I rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And this hope does not disappoint because I've been, uh, the love of God has been shed abroad in my heart by the Holy Spirit he's given me. All the while, while he's disciplining me, he's also comforting me, saying, Abba, Father, in the spirit of sonship, testifying that I'm a child of God and an heir and drawing me near, drawing me near as my high priest. He's uh, interceding for me. And his, he gives me his word as an anchor for my soul that brings me into the presence within the veil, drawing me into the holiest place, saturating me with himself, and giving me a taste of a feast. And I eventually learn, you know what? It's not pleasant out there in the flesh anyway. The training does so many things. It teaches me to judge the flesh. It teaches me to die to the law. And finally, it teaches me the pleasant atmosphere of the Father's love and draws me in to hide in Christ and say, you know what, I'm just going to depend on you. I'm going to stay on the altar as a living sacrifice, and I'm also going to enjoy this feast you've prepared for me. That's how I want to live. That's what justification is for. Justification is so that you will keep coming to God in spite of everything and enjoying him until he becomes a feast to you. Okay? And then from that comes the fruit of the Spirit. There will be no fruit if you don't know how to enjoy Christ and abide in Him. Because apart from Him, you can do nothing. And it has to be His life in you. And the fruit is born with patience. There's four soils, and the second soil gets offended when the persecution comes. The third soil has all kinds of cares and anxieties of this age. You know what that ca the cares come from in many cases? Galatian error. This age is an evil religious age and it's full of antichrists and terrors that we've been studying in the Jude and 1 John. The, the age is religious. That's what we need to be saved from. The world in general, it's okay. I mean, we have to live in it, but we're not of it. That's not where we have our problem. Our problem is the religious world. That's the one that makes us dance and makes us feel guilty and makes us think God's mad at us and teaches us error. 
and it damages our conscience and makes us anxious. But the love of God casts out all the fear. And as we continue to abide in Christ and let that which we heard from the beginning abide in us so that we abide in him and in the Father and stay focused on the gospel and stay on the ground of justification, we keep coming forward boldly and eventually we learn to reject the teachers that may argue for eternal security but tell us that the, war, where the Christian life is a matter of works. Once we turn from that error, we will find it easier to abide in the pasture, and then we'll be perfected in the love of Christ, and the love and and the love of God will be perfected in our heart, and will cast out the fear, and we will rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, and that love will be shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost, and we will start bearing fruit. Now, people will say that you're not nice because you will start drawing, making distinctions where they didn't make distinctions, and they'll say you're not walking in love, and they'll hate you because of the testimony of Christ. And they will reveal that they're taking the way of Cain and they're of the evil one, but that's fine. You'll actually start bearing fruit, and that fruit isn't, oh, you're a nice person, although that's true. They can't recognize it, though, because their version of nice is just religious church culture with a bunch of learned, uh, sweetie, uh, sweetheart phrases, but not the real love, which, you know, says, hey, there's a wolf, you know. Now, there are a bunch of hirelings working for a wage, and they let the wolves run everywhere and say, you need to love the wolves. Now, we warn about the wolves, and we point out the pasture, and they hate us for it. Um, but the fruit we bear is people know how to stand confidently before the Lord in their freedom in Christ. The fruit is the New Testament ministry. That's the fruit that God's interested in. It's the multiplication of Christ and the enjoyment and the pasture and the feast. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is that justification, because of the nature of it, is not just a doctrine to argue. You know, there's a lot of people that seem to be are really good at contending for justification, but they're just wall trolls. And... Uh, Eventually, they reveal that they don't understand justification either because they're just arguing for justification when you die and the eternal life is forever and everything. They're going from wall to wall and, and they're just railers too. They don't enjoy the eternal life because they don't see that justification is for now that I can enjoy the Spirit. And they don't see that the Spirit is to be enjoyed. And they're unclean still. To be unclean is, uh, you know, Jesus said, don't cast your pearls before swine uh, or your treasures before the dogs. And it's not to be unsaved, but unclean animals in the Old Testament in Leviticus were known by the fact that they did not chew the cud. Cows, for example, have four stomachs and they chew and regurgitate and chew again and digest and regurgitate and chew again and write. It's really kind of gross from our mind. But they are actually getting every bit of nutrient from the food they eat. And God calls those clean animals because they assimilate everything they eat. Whereas a dog indiscriminately eats things, does not hardly digest it, poops it all right out. They'll eat a McDonald's cardboard box and poop it right out. You'll see the cardboard box on the ground. They don't digest anything. That's unclean eating. And that's how many people devour the word. They're looking for an argument. And they go and find a bunch of scriptures that prove their point, And then they go rail against each other with those scriptures. That is not how we take the word. The word needs to be spirit and life to us. And there's a lot of people who are telling me right now that they're kind of discontent. They're tired of doctrinal arguments. And so they're losing interest in the word because that's how they saw it. Was while well, I was arguing for eternal security. But now I'm really grounded in that. And now I'm kind of getting bored. Memorize the Bible. Take Colossians or John 14 through 17 or Philippians or Ephesians. Take one verse a day, put it on an index card, and set a timer for yourself on your phone. And every 25 minutes, get it out and see how closely you can match it by memory and focus on every word. Okay? But don't focus it on trying to just memorize for the sake of memory. Taste it. You know, uh, 
taste the word. Let it be milk to you. Let it be meat to you. Let it be taste. There's a, there's a honey taste to the word. And if you've never tasted the word with your spirit, there's a delight in it that that is incredible. And you do one verse a day, and I recommend a book or a chapter because it, you can track your progress, and at the end of like two weeks, you've got a whole chapter that you can recite from memory perfectly. And as you do, like you're in your car, you're waiting, and you think you're going to be bored, but you start reciting the entire first chapter of Philippians. And every word, you can feel it rising up in you like living water. And you'll start getting revelation and insight too. But the main thing is to recognize that the word is spirit and life and is the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ. And that you need to be nourished and washed. And it's not so important to memorize the word and have a whole lot of doctrine as much as it is to fellowship with Christ through the word and to focus on his presence in you and to acknowledge him. And if you have not subscribed to Vonda, uh, oh gosh, I think her ch channel is Lamb in the Pasture. She has been doing such a beautiful job of meditating on the word. I say it's like, she, it, she's a young sister, very young sister, but she's so constituted with the word. And she, um, it's like she goes, she's going through Philippians, and it's like she's taking us on an art museum tour. And she goes to each verse, and she looks at the verse and says, this is really nice. And then she shares what she likes about the verse, and all kinds of utterance comes out. And then she goes on to the next little painting, which is the next verse. And then at the end of the teaching, she says, I'm going to give thanks. And she then prays the word, and you can taste it. There's a sweetness to it. And, and that is a good example of what I'm talking about, of someone letting the word dwell in them richly. Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Uh, singing and making melody to yourselves, to the Lord in your heart, you know. We, we've we got to have a... So, so, so there's a lot of people who understand what Galatian era is, but they haven't entered into the enjoyment yet of the word. And that's the next step, is we've got to taste the spirit. But we're still contending for the truth. And uh, there's a, I've got a whole bunch of new subscribers, so I wanted to describe what is Galatian Air and say, look, the source of it is, a lot in a lot of cases, the very evangelists who are... And, you know, that video that I saw was several years old. That may be not consistent with everything he's teaching. I don't know. Um, I'm not calling somebody out and asking them to answer for anything. But what I'm saying is, this is the concept, you know, uh, that people are teaching justification is go to heaven... And then on earth, your life is by works. And that is not true. Our life is the just shall live by faith. Justification is for today, this moment. Uh, it is how I, by faith, stand before the Lord, even though I'm a sinner, ungodly. I can open up to him and come to him boldly and access the spirit. And all the benefits of sonship are freely available to me. Even if I just did the worst sin you can imagine. As a believer, I have that right. Um, and then the law teachers will say, see, you're antinomian and you're teaching a license to sin. Who cares what they say? Honestly, they're going to hell. You can forget them. Seriously. They don't believe the gospel. Uh, and so because they deny the person and work of Christ and they spend their entire time railing against the saints, darkness is reserved for them as we're studying in Jude. They're the ones making the accusation that the grace of Christ is a license to sin, and they're the ones denying the Lord. They're denying that his blood is the propitiation for sin, and they're denying justification, and they're twisting the word and redefining it. They've taken the way of Cain. And we'll we'll go back to Jude in a little bit and study that more. But um, I'm going to be real bold. I'm not, I'm not shrinking back at all because of these people. They're, the more bold I am, the more they have to reveal what they believe to counter what we're saying. And I want you to see exactly what they believe out of their own mouths. Uh, okay, take care.